go ahead and invite our panelists for our Black Men in White Coats panel to come up. Um, so we have uh, first Dr. Linda Ray Murray. She'll be moderating the panel discussion today. Dr. Trayvon Thompson. Dr. Adonis Ducre. And Dr. Pierre Johnson. So Dr. Brian Williams is unable to join us today. He had a canceled flight, so he sends his apologies. Um, but we have some great folks here, and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing this conversation. How's the lunch, okay? Yes. So let me break this down in English. Young folks, you can go in the back and get a second lunch if you want. There's plenty. So don't, don't be hungry. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to be here with these gentlemen. I have to, first of all, apologize for my good brother, Dr. Whitaker. He had to be out of town, but uh, it's no problem to be here. The second thing I want to say, so think now, because I have a bunch of questions, but I really want questions to come from you all. So we'll have people in the audience, I'm told, with microphones. So this is your opportunity to ask these three gentlemen any kind of question that you want. There's no question that's a dumb question, and there's no question you can't ask in this setting or family. So let me start off by asking all three gentlemen, when did you first think that you might want to become a physician? I guess I'm up first. Um, good afternoon now. My name is Trevon Thompson. Um, I actually can, I don't remember a time where I did not want to be a physician. I've wanted to be a doctor since I was a little, little kid. Um, oh, all right. Is this better? That's really close. Okay. Um, so, uh, I don't remember a time when I did not want to be a physician. I wanted to be a physician since I was a small child. Um, and so, I, I, that was the pathway that I wanted to go down. Um, I, if you were paying attention earlier, I put my nose to the grind um, and kept going through until I hit my goal. So, for me, uh, Pierre Johnson, uh, so, <coughs> that feedback killed him, I saw that. Anyway. So, um, as a kid, I was uh, five years old. I believe I'm from, from the south side of Chicago. And, um, you know, like any, like any other kid from the south side of Chicago, I wanted to play basketball. I wanted to be like Jordan. So, you know, so when the question was asked, what do you want to do, that was it. And so I had an aunt um, that challenged me and made me pick a plan B. And she said, I'm not going to leave you alone until you tell me something else that if that doesn't happen. And I was like, I'm gonna, it's going to happen anyway. I said that because the only true positive thing that was on TV at that point was the Cosby Show. So, you know, we, we look at, you know, obviously what's happening now, uh, but back then, um, you know, that, that imprinted on my mind. You had a black man in a position that he was taking care of his family, he was taking care of patients, he was well respected, and that imprinted on my young five-year-old mind at that time, uh, and that's what I wanted to do. And then so I kept saying that, and then, you know, he was an OBGYN too, so I was like, that's pretty cool. He delivered babies, you know, he'll have a hoagie. You know, it's, it's, it's cool all in the day. Um, and then um, when I was nine, my mom was pregnant with my brother. And so that whole, like the physiological transformation of pregnancy and how that happened was very like shocking to me as a kid. So I start asking questions and asking questions and, uh, and my mom's OB was a black man um, at the time. And instead of him not giving me attention, uh, he took the time to answer my questions. So from then, I, I mean, I knew exactly what I wanted to do as a kid. And that's what I am now. Uh, good, af good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adonis Ducre. Um, I no, it didn't Good afternoon. My name is Adonis Ducre. 
Um, I have a doctorate in pharmacy. I have a doctorate in pharmacy. Um, I've always liked entrepreneurship. I always wanted to start my own business, even as a little kid. I would get in trouble selling candy on the bus and, you know, doing it at, selling candy at school. And um, I was, you know, I was an average student in high school. I think I was, you know, average. Um, and I went to college and I just wanted, my dad was like, hey, you know, just go to college, just get in and get out. You know, my dad didn't go to college. Um, and what happened while I was in college, I picked business. And I came in touch, I went to Grambling State University, HBCU in uh, Louisiana. And um, during my first year of school, the lifestyle was so different. I think all through college, I never, I got 4.0 all through college. And one of the things that happened um, my first year was a professor, my chemistry professor came in touch with me and was like, hey man, like business, you're not gonna make money doing this. He's like, you know, you're a black man. Um, you need to get a skill set in sciences. He's like, whatever you do, it has to be science, engineering, just something, he said, because you know, most people who go into college one way, you come out the same way. You're not gonna go to college and just come out rich. But he's like, you need a, you know. So from that point forward, I did some research and he became my mentor, which was the biggest blessing, you know, I think in my life. And he kind of directed me towards chemistry and research and I ended up, um, spending some time at University of Wisconsin in Madison, and that's when I decided like, hey, I want to do pharmacy because I'll be able to start my own pharmacies and kind of have something to fall back on if you know, it doesn't work out. So from there, that's, that's kind of how I got involved. It wasn't anything I thought about or it just, I just kind of, good people, good around me just kind of put me in the right position, so. Can y'all hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, my name is Abdullah Pratt. I'm an uh, emergency medicine uh, attending physician at the University of Chicago in the New Trauma Center. Um, but uh, how many of you all are here from Chicago? If I raise a hand. Perfect. How many of you all are here from like the south or the west side? How many of you all here would claim that you all are from the streets? Right? That was me, right? So when I was in these, you know, in, in these um, sessions like this, these kind of network building, you know, professional panels and things like that. I always felt like I didn't belong. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm from right off 87th and, uh, and Jeffrey and Stoney, but then also a little bit right off 63rd and Cottage. That's where I spent most of my time. South side. Yeah, we right, we right, we from it. But, uh, but the reality of things is that my journey into medicine was born similarly to Pierre, similarly to others up here, was born from me seeing the ills and the pain that happened in my community and not really knowing what to do with it. And over time, I would meet people who would say, hey, listen, if you want to see the violence change, if you want to see your grandma, your auntie stop having to have their foot cut off at early ages, you want to stop seeing your friend who has asthma spending, you know, weeks in the ER waiting rooms day after day to the point where they have to be remediated in school because of truancy, then maybe you're the solution to that problem, right? Maybe you should stop, you know, asking who's doing what and you should raise your hand and say, what can you do to fashion yourself into somebody who can help cause change? And so that's led me to a career in emergency medicine where I don't get to pick and choose who my patients are, right? Like I see the worst of the worst. I wanted to scrape the bottom of the bucket, right? You know, when, when your mama's cooked that macaroni and cheese, you want to get that bottom piece. And some people are like, I don't want that, right? Like I'm that person that's like, no, that, that cooking's good enough. I love it. Let me get the bottom of the pan. And so that's what my career is like. Right, so I get to see people, oftentimes people who I know in my own community. I walk in the ER every day. I don't walk through the back door. I walk right through the front door, right through the waiting room, right through the thick of it. And somebody somewhere is going to be like, oh, you know, Dula, what's up? Or, you know, Dr. Pratt, you know, hey, you know, I'm here. People from the community who have seen me grow up. And that keeps me on my toes. And that keeps me uh, in a position where I have a responsibility to really, really fight for those people who I know and love. There's not a single person I grew up with. There's not a single family member that I know or love that isn't on these streets of Chicago, in the south suburbs, or on the west side of Chicago, or in Milwaukee, or in Baltimore, in similar places like this. So every bit of what I do gets me there. But I wasn't a perfect student. In high school, I was an all-state athlete in football. I had a GPA that unweighted was like a 2.7. I was a knucklehead. I was that kid that got A's on all the tests. I felt like he didn't have to listen to his teachers, right? But it was, uh, it was me coming in contact with a chance occasion where I got in trouble and I out debated my principal, my assistant principal, everybody to the point where they were like, listen, you, you, you too smart to have this conversation with. Like, what do you want to do with your career, man? What can we do to help you, you know, 
uh, not get in trouble like this. And I was like, I want to be a doctor. And they put me in touch with Northwestern's H prep program that was starting the next day. That's the high school preparatory recruitment and exposure program. And literally got the application in, started the next day, won awards there. I got connected with people that put me in pipeline programs at the University of Chicago. I was able to, you know, somehow, some way catch the eye of people there. And I've never left. And, and for me, my, my, the institution that I work at, the University of Chicago, where I've trained, even though it has a history of racism and systemic injustice to the community that's around it, for me, that's a closer walk than it was for me to get to my high school. That was a closer walk than it was for me to, to go to any of the programs that I dealt with. And so for me, that's truly home. And I felt like I, I'll take that pay cut, right? Like I'll do the research. I'll take an academic route. I'll, you know, take the L, right? I'll take the loss if it means that I'm able to open a pathway, you know, have a career in academics where I can work helping more students out like you all in the crowd. And so that's kind of what brought me to my career in medicine. Great. So, so did you all hear what the brother said? He, he was a knucklehead. I don't know him, so I don't know, I don't know if he outgrew it or not. But, but I know people like him, okay? I raise people like him. So let me again remind you, before I go through a series of questions, don't be afraid. This is family. If you want to come up here and ask a question, ask it. So let me be clear with the, the four of you gentlemen again. Are you saying that I could go to, one of you went to college and wasn't thinking anything about health and became a pharmacist. Are you saying that I could maybe go to college not thinking clearly what I want to do and it's not too late to go into healthcare, it's not too late to become a physician or another health professional? You already answered that there on the end, but. Yeah, I'm, I definitely think um, the biggest thing that I, the biggest advice I would give is just, you know, to have a really good foundation in, you know, science, math, English. I mean, at the end of the day, in your professional career, you have to be able to, you know, write well, um, understand just certain foundational things, um, learning how to communicate more and with different types of people in different ways and kind of understanding um, yourself. I think that's the biggest part because you don't want to get into something. It's, it's easy to relatively speaking, it's easy to get into a profession. It's much harder to sustain and to actually do well at it. So you always, I always feel like you have to know why you're doing something and you have to have, um, it's gotta be something you really wanna do. Um, so I think you don't always have all the answers, but um, I always say go to college. <laughs> don't think you don't need it, but just do well in whatever, you can be an arts major, just do well in that and get your core competencies core competency, because I always believe like every experience you have, or, or it, it helps professionally, I'm sure up here, you know, all of us up here, use some, something from our background that's non-healthcare related to be a better healthcare provider, so. And to answer your question, I would say, no you don't, but uh, it's unacceptable to challenge uh, kids. I don't care how old you are, I don't care, you know, if you're 40 or if you 10. Um, and we, we take that answer a lot of like, when you ask a kid, like, what do you want to do? And you say, I don't know. And that's okay, but why don't you know? Because every kid, every adult in here, they'll spend, you know, an hour a day on social media. You look at Facebook, you look at Instagram, you look at all this stuff, you spend all of this erroneous time looking at things, but why don't you just for two weeks, if you don't know what you want to do, just for two weeks, take a half hour a day and start Google searching. Like when I was, when I was, you know, and you guys is, you know, high school, or whatever. We didn't have that, right? So we had to go to the library, the old-fashioned way, and open books and look. Like right now, you have the world of information at your fingertips. And instead of saying you don't know what you want to do, sit down for 30 minutes a day for two weeks and look at different professions. And what you'll find out is, is that you know, it's certain things you don't like that don't fit you. Well, I don't want to be a construction worker. I don't want to be a school teacher. I don't want to be, you'll find out what you don't like, but more importantly, you'll find out things that you do like, right? And when you find those things out, the most important thing that you'll do is you'll set a goal for yourself, right? Once you set a goal for yourself, like say for instance, you're 11 years old and say, I want to be a lawyer, right? It's imprinted in your mind that you have a goal to do something. So then once you start working toward that, you'll really start learning more about yourself and what you want to do. And you may get 13, 14 years old and say, well, I really don't want to be a lawyer because they have to do this and they have to do that. Then what are you going to do after that? Anybody? 
you're going to set a new goal, right? So you're not going to say, okay, well, I don't want to be a lawyer, then I'll just go back to saying I don't know what I want to do. Once you set that goal for yourself and you don't reach it, then you're, or, or you don't want to do it, then you're going to set a new goal for yourself. And that's super important. It doesn't matter how old you are. I was in medical school. I had people in my medical school class that were in their 50s, early 50s. I got, you know, I'm mentoring somebody right now that is in his early 50s. He just got tired of, uh, he was an engineer, tired of everything. He was like, look, I want to change healthcare in my community or what have you. He could have said, well, I'm too old, it's too late. Instead, he said, no, nah, I'm going to live my purpose. You have to live your purpose. If you're waking up every morning and you hate going to work and you hate doing, somebody telling you what to do and you're like, I can't, I don't like this. I'm just going for a paycheck, then you're not living your purpose. So you have to live your purpose no matter how old you are. If you're 50 or if you're 5 or you're 10 or what have you, whatever you're doing, all your efforts and your energy have to go towards living the purpose and what God called you to do. Just, just to echo, you know, what Big Bro said up here is one of the things that you, that you all have to do is move with urgency. I think that's, that's, you know, the core of what it is. If you're moving with urgency with anything, for those of you all who are taking chemistry or physics, when you're existing at a high energy level or state of existence, then you can be molded into any different direction that you go into. So if you all see the problems of your hood and you're like, I don't know what I want to do, but I know that if I'm not active and I'm not moving, then I'm going to fall victim and succumb to my streets. Then if you find out you love science or you find out you love business or engineering, or you want to help people, you know, through healthcare, then you can do it. A, mo a lot of the young brothers that I know, and even a few young sisters that I know, they are now getting into medicine by way of emerge like EMTs, right? So they didn't really go to college at all. They just went straight out, and said, "Listen, my family needs money. I'm going to go to Malcolm X, or I'm going to go to, you know, South Suburbs, something like that, and I'm going to go become an EMT so I can work on an ambulance." So at 18, 19, they were already working either as, you know, EMTBs, which is a basic EMT or they were working in emergency rooms or hospitals as technicians, right, without a college degree, again. And they were able to do that the entire time I was in, like, medical school, undergrad. They were making money. They are financially better than me, and now they're applying to get into medical school. So we, I saw so many of them in my emergency room that we created a group called Black EMTs to Black EMDs, emergency medical doctors, right, because that's what they all want to do. It's like five of them, right, all in one ER, young, you know, black women and, 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 and men who at each and every level are either uh, at the junior level of college is what you probably say, like before the MCAT, some are just taking the MCAT like in a week or two, some have taken it and post bags, and then we got one that's actually one of the first year medical students at Princeton School of Medicine at the University of Chicago. But that's an atypical route that they all took that was able to make some money, most of them didn't have good grades coming right out, and they were able to then shift because they had been active in their communities. None of that work that they did prior to that was wasted, right? Like that was all now gold, and now it's like, okay, well, you got real experience. You've been in the streets doing it. I know people that done that with research, right? Where they didn't know what they wanted to do, didn't know what they wanted to do in medicine. They got uh, MPH, a master's in public health, or they got an MBA in business, and then they were able to flip that into something that they could use to help strengthen their applications to get into medical school. But the other side of that is don't close the door on yourself. I think Pierre said that too, is don't be that person that closes the door on your own self. Don't get like a cheating thing in college. Don't be the person that was lazy, so like, oh, I just like, you know, plagiarize this paper off the internet. Like, that stuff is irrecoverable, right? Like, you will not get into a medical school anywhere with something that's on your transcript that said, like, I cheated. Don't, you know, and, and this isn't the most one, but don't get a felony, right? Like, like if you, you get misdemeanor, you work around that. But don't put yourself in a position if you're riding in the car four deep with the guys and one of them's riding dirty and then that gets put on you, right? Like, don't close that door on yourself. Have some self-value. And then you can figure it out as you go, but just have that urgency not to fall back into the, into deep, deep into the streets. And then other people around you will protect you. The drug dealers will be like, hey, you got something bigger, better set out for you. I don't want you out here, or et cetera. Are you working on this program? So I would say don't close the door and then do something that can be molded in the future to that even if right now you're not on that standard track into medicine. I, I'm looking for questions. If you have a question, wave, wave at me. So we, yes, sir. And then you, yes. First of all, I don't need a mic. First of all, I just want to say that you guys are so unique that none of you guys look like Bob. This way. 
can't hear. I wanted to see my kids. I wanted them to see what they could become. I'm from the block. I was worse than you. I was the one to chase you down the block. I'm from 83rd, Foster Park. Lived the life. But at 18, my dad said, you should just go to college and hang out and see. I went, and I was amazed by the girls. I said, oh my god. And I'm saying, you guys like fat dudes? They was like, yeah, he's smart, though. But my grades were always A's and B's. So I stayed. I've been accepted to a doctoral program. Didn't want to tell my kids I just was tired of studying. I was tired of reading. I still might take the program. I got a lot going on in my life, but you guys are unbelievable. This dude with these joints on, they'll never think you were a doctor. You're going to get pulled over just like I would. But it's so amazing. And I love you guys. My man on the end, I play football. Us big guys got to see together. God bless all of you. I mean, testing, testing. it's kind of awesome. my, my brother. So, hold on. This, this, this is what doctors look like. Right, that's what I'm saying. But, I want but, to hold on. Can I but speak let's, a let's, let's Can give some love to a CPS teacher here. We're here in their hall. I want to thank them for letting us use the hall. Yes, I want, sir. I want, can, I come in, can I come in on what he oh, said? Yes, though? yeah. So, like, he, I mean, he's, and, and congratulations to you, brother. That's, that's, that's admirable. And I'm not, when I say this, I'm not, I'm not on you, but... Um, and I say this to everybody, like, you know, because, you know, I've, I've gotten looks about, like, man, is he really a doctor or whatever? Yes, I am. I'm board certified, obstetrician, gynecologist, specialized in innovation surgery. Oh, I'm not saying that for that. I don't, no, don't, don't clap for that. I'm telling you that because as, as much as I could tell you that, I could tell you about Migos and boop bop the bam and flip flap and this, that. I could, I could turn that on and off. But the problem is, let me tell you what the true problem is, is that when we say, like, you don't look like a doctor, right? That's a negative stereotypical image that the media has portrayed to what young black excellence is supposed to look like, right? So they have put us in a box to where like all our kids, they're, you, the, only, the only semblance of excellence that you see is on TV, of being a rapper or entertainer or you know, dancing or something, like something that only a few of us can attain to. So then when we go out in the streets, when we have this look or appearance Right? We're getting brutalized and, and, and the masses see us in a certain way because that's what the media has portrayed. But what the most egregious thing that happens is that the stereotypical narrative isn't just the masses, it's us. Right? It's us. So my patients, when they bring when I when I'm seeing family members or whatever, everybody got their phones Googling, trying to see like what's his background, this, that, and if he can't be a doctor, you look too young, you got earrings, you got mohawks. Like this is uh, is a cancer, it's a disease. And what we have to do is we have to change that negative stereotypical narrative, and that's my goal. Like I don't change me for anybody, right? And my and what I can't tell you. Because I'm from South Side Chicago too. I grew up, grew up in Chatham, 86 in Calumet, then 100, I mean, and then uh, Morgan Park area. I went to school in Roseland, right? So, like, my story is the same. But the thing is, is that that change only happens when we make them change their thought process, right? So now, when I go in to see a patient and they see that I have all of this, so I got, I mean, I got tattoos. From, all on my back, all on my arms, sleeves everywhere, what have you. So that is already already thought of as a negative stereotypical image. But when you see that doing something positive as the surgeon, as the engineer, as the lawyer, or what have you, you start to change perceptions. So now it's not, oh yeah, that he doesn't really look like that. He don't really look like a doctor. It looks like that because it ain't enough of us, right? We need y'all. We need y'all. We need you all to, to put the grind in and say, look. I want to be that, and I have to, because like you said, we, all of us, we walking through the hospitals, ain't nobody look like me, right? Ain't nobody look like, so they, they yes. have, they, they're comfortable feeling, making, they're comfortable thinking that way because the, the stereotype is true. And the stereotype is, the, type, ah, the stereotype is true because we're not changing it. So with that being said, I challenge everybody, everybody, there, there have to be more of us that are doctors, that are lawyers, that are engineers, and are in these spaces of excellence so that the negative stereotypical narratives change. And we 
it starts with us in our thought processes. And don't don't tell no kid like, oh man, you you know you you twelve like why you you can't wear your hair like that? You can't that you can't you can't be a doctor. Look, yes, they can. Don't tell no kid that because they can because I did it, and there are many kids like like me. There are I'm not just the only one. I'm not an anomaly, right? There are other doctors and there are other black professionals that come from these places that are in these spaces, the problem is that's not glorified. The media is not gonna put that on TV for you to see. They'll rather put buffoonery on TV so you can see that. But they're not gonna, they, where channel nine at? Where channel five at? Where all of the, where the news people like showing this? They're not gonna do that. They'll rather go on 79th Street showing, you know, kids shooting up each other, right? So we have to be in these spaces more so that we can see this and understand that this high level of excellence is afforded to us all. Go ahead. I'm, I'm gonna take this one one further so that y'all can understand this. When, when I was coming through med school, like I had like clean cut, haircut, my face was all that cut like that. And then as I started growing my hair, I would get like, you know, people like, oh, well, you, you look like my nephew, like patients. And then at the time, I didn't really know how to feel that because, again, I'm still in the streets. I'm trying to portray something other than myself. And I had somebody that actually pointed me in the direction of P. Like, oh, somebody was like, oh, have you, do you know this guy named Dr. Johnson? Like, you know, he's doing some great work. And I'm just like, oh, I, don't, I don't think I don't think I heard of him. Like, yeah, he wears his hair this way, you know, this and that. And I was like, oh, man, well, you know, it's time to let the beast out then. If that's the case, I'm like, <laughs> you know, we, we need to be. And then I would luckily meet him a few years later. But, you know, the, the truth of it is, is that even on top of what, what Pierre is saying, it's actually that element of looking a certain way, looking of yourself that actually helps you do the real work of helping your community, right? So if you talk, if you one of them kind of docs that just want to leave the block and uh, I, I don't know where I was from. I was from Chicago. It was some bad things. I don't want to talk about it. You one of those kind of people that just want to live out your life. That's cool, right? Like being clean cut, you probably have to go in a lot of places where you're the only black person. The, uh, okay, you're not really helping your streets very much. But if you one of those that look at your community, you always on social media, talking about I'm tired of this I'm tired of this these, my people being killed or X Y and Z and you want to go back and do that work if you come talking to your people like you ain't one of them they gonna treat you like you ain't one of them and so if you got a project that you're working on they not gonna be receptive to that when you got that young 17 year old cat that's just been shot and he nobody he's not listening to nobody they about to put him down but he could die if you don't help him and somebody needs to help him you're not talking like him hey bro get up out my face man don't touch me dude right like that's how they gonna come at you, but if you like, hey, bro, I ain't one of the ops. I'm here to help you and only you. I don't talk to them. I don't trust them either. They're like, all right, big bro, just, just don't let me die, right? If it's the old lady who's like, you know, like, hey, sweetie pie, why are you? you supposed to be the stepper set tonight. What's got you in my ER tonight? Oh, hey, baby, you know, you remind me of my grandson, you know? They, it starts to help you, right? It, it helps you foster a better doctor-patient relationship. It's, even as a pharmacist, I'm sure that that helps you understand what meds are. You, you got the sugar? Okay, well, if you got, that means you got diabetes, so you, you're probably taking the metformin. Well, yeah, something with an M, right? Like, you can help walk people through because you have a true cultural connection, and you are shifting that paradigm back into the community, which is where the real solution is. These solutions to our problems ain't going to come from outside of us. It's only going to come from within us, so we have to start embracing who we are, what we are. If you want to help that young brother, be like, listen, man, maybe learning a different type of dress is cool. I'm not telling you to change yourself, but hey, learning how to put on a shirt and tie may help you one day, that should be encouraged, right? But to just be like, hey, throw away who you are, all of this stuff is worthless, you know, you're telling him he's worthless, you're telling him all of his friends are worthless. And so if he does become successful, don't be looking at him to come back to the community because everybody around him told him that that community was worthless. So I agree with you 100%, Pete. Now, now I just wanna say, I, I understand what y'all saying. It took me a long time to get my first and only tattoo. But my clean cut brother at the end here, you know he's a real brother. He's doing no, good. No, I know, I know I'm I, his team. And I'm not saying that. Listen, listen. I'm All I'm saying that is, look, be you. You be you. Be you. Like a, a, again, well, if I'm if I'm going into a corporate setting, will you see me with chains and Jordans on? No. So there's a time and space for everything. I got three piece suits and what have you that I that I put on when it's time for it. But. When I'm going to where I can be myself, and I like I can't talk. Sometimes you know there are kids that are going to relate, right? But there are different kids 
they can't relate. They're like, man, you don't, you don't really look like me. You don't talk like me. I can't understand what you're talking about. So for those kids, I am being who I am. I'm not putting on a facade. I am showing them that I'm you, and you can, you can see yourself through me. So for everybody out there, it's a lane and a space for everybody. Just be you. But if everybody says, look, I have to be you know, a clean cut image or whatever, even though I'm not like that, I have to be like that because the world wants me to be. All of the kids that are behind you that are looking at you and are looking for hope and inspiration, they can't feel you. Like, be yourself. Be yourself, that's important. Yes, sir. Can you guys hear me? My voice is deep. All right, cool. <laughs> Um, my name is John. I'm a third year medical student. I'm aspiring to be an emergency medicine doctor, so shout out to you guys. Awesome. I want to take the conversation in a different direction, if I may. So knowing what you guys told us now, and in your respective careers, I think it's pretty safe to say that racism and prejudice and negative stereotypes amongst black men and black women, for that matter, in medicine exists. So can you share with us exactly how it is that you deal with these negative stereotypes, with these, this, this racist and prejudice, because yes, while it is commendable, while it's respectable amongst us to see us be black doctors, to be upstanding members of our community making a difference, not everybody absolutely sees that as us, especially black men. You know, like you just said, we can still be pulled over by the cops. I was just pulled over by the cops two weeks ago because I live in the South Side, and I literally was just got off of work at four in the morning. I pulled up. They thought that I was being suspicious, even though I was literally just getting home from work. So how is it that we can change that negative stereotype that's held upon us, and how do you guys specifically navigate through those negative stereotypes in your respective careers? I guess, I guess I'll, I'll start with this one. First, to respond to earlier, so this is me. I am clean cut. That's just who I am. Uh, I can't pretend to be anything else. <laughs> um, I, I'm comfortable in my bow tie with my close haircut. That's just who I am. So, uh, you know, we all have our own narratives. I don't have a narrative similar to some of the gentlemen here, um, and that's okay. Um, we all come from different perspectives. We all come from different spaces, um, and I'm still able to do the things that I need to do. Being comfortable in my skin is who I am. Um, and so, but not to, you know, we all have different stories. And I think for, it, it's important, I'll answer the question in a second. It is important, I think, for us, this audience, to see the diversity closer, closer. of us, right? There is not one single African American or black narrative. We have, there's a plurality of who we are. There's a diversity of who we represent. And that's okay. We don't have to be a single way to have a singular purpose in advancing um, health advancing pharmacy, advancing whatever it may be. Um, so just to say that aside, this is me. Um, the, to answer that question um, about how I've dealt with racism, so I have certainly dealt with it um, everywhere. Um, I am lucky, I think I went to an HBCU. I went to Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans for undergrad, <laughs> XU in the house. Um, I think that was a good preparation for going into a lot of spaces where I clearly did not belong. Um, med school was a challenge. Um, med school was hard academically, and I was dealing with all of the implicit biases and the overt racism that goes in being in med school, and that persisted throughout all of my training. I think the first uh, way to deal with it is, uh, it, it, I don't have any, there's no one single piece of advice to this. Every situation is slightly different. There were times when I felt the need as a trainee to speak out. There were also times when as a trainee, I felt it would put me in too vulnerable a place to speak out. So I just held on to it and thankfully I had good outlets with my family, supports, that sort of thing. Um, I am at a position in my career now. Um, I am a, an academic physician. I have tenure um, and I'm in a place where I can speak out more, much more aggressively when I see um, injustices, overt racism, implicit biases, et cetera. Um, so I, I'm in a different place now where I can respond to those types of issues in a way that I could not earlier in my career. Man, I, I, can answer, I can answer for you simply. You play the game until you're in a position to make the change, right, period, right? So just like I was saying, like, it's a game, right? It's a game that you have to play. And keeping it real can go wrong, like Dave Chappelle said. And, I, and to quote somebody else, uh, like Jeezy said, like, stay down till you come up, right? So I'll give, you, I'll give you a story. So I'm in medical school, 
right? I'm in my third year of medical school, actually, right? And I talk about this in the book we have. We talk about that later, but I, I'm in my third year of medical school, and I, and I wanted to do surgery. I'm real passionate about surgery. I'm like, man, I really, like, this is my thing. So I'm in general surgery, and I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go. Right. I'm, go I'm going in. I'm like, I'm trying to suck up everything like a sponge. So the way surgery worked was is that you have the medical student, you got the intern, which is the first year uh, resident, and then you had a chief resident, which may be a fourth or fifth year resident. Right. So we come in here now and I'm just like, OK, I'm going to try to absorb as much as I can from these guys and talk. And um, in the beginning, I'm just, you know, they told us like, oh, yeah, we have multiple evaluations, uh, you know, so it doesn't matter if you do don't do so well here, um, then, you know, this person evaluate, everything will balance out. Meanwhile, in my mind, I'm like, I know this is some trash because I, I will, you know, the same thing, I will say better answers, I'll arrive earlier, I'll do the exact same thing as my white counterpart, but I'm getting the, oh, he needs to read more, or he needs to do this, or he needs to do that, but fine, let's play the game. So I'm here, I meet them for the first time. The, the chief resident was a 53-year-old, white male pastor. So this guy with, with had his own congregation, decided he wanted to go back to medical school. I'm like, man, if I get a fair shake, it's going to be from this dude. It got to be the pastor. We're good. So then, so then he had the intern. So we sitting down, you know, whatever. I introduced myself or what have you. So you get, I spent two weeks with these guys, literally every single day. We sit down. He hit the, the chief resident would look at the intern, don't even look at me, don't even acknowledge my presence, talk to him, don't say much of anything to me, right? And I'm just like, you know, some trying to get some interaction. I knew it was a bad vibe from the jump. I didn't do anything, I didn't say anything to him. I knew it was a bad vibe, right? So I'm like, I'm gonna be cool. He say little slick stuff, like he like says little stuff to try to provoke me, the only times he would ever talk to me. Fast forward, we're in surgery, and I'm there, like, so the job of a medical student is to transport the patient after the surgery, right? He tells me this. He says, so I'm transporting a patient. He's like, Pierre, this is, this is where a, a small mind and a strong back come into play. No lie. No joke. Said this to me. So in this instance, Southside P, <laughs> right, said, oh, no, I choked it, dog. Like, so, I, so I had to suppress that because my narrative would have been completely different and I wouldn't be sitting here at that I had to suppress that, but you have to play the game. I eventually, I eventually, I passed everything for the course, and they eventually made me remediate the rotation because of what he said, and because like no matter everything else, they made me remediate something I earned, and I had to spend like four years, and I mean four years, four weeks in Pontiac, Illinois, working up on this. I mean I had to do a whole bunch of craziness, but. I had to play the game. Fast forward, 2020, I just got a letter in the mail that now my medical school is honoring me next month for being somebody, but, but, and I appreciate it. But I'm telling you that to say, look, we're all going to be, man, it don't change. I don't care what level that you're at. I am, I'm, I'm in private practice, I have my own stuff or what have you, I'm still dealing with racism in my own place right to this day. It don't stop, however, the more powerful you get, the more you get up into that point in where you control your narrative. Now I can say, man, you ain't gonna talk. This is what you gonna do. You gonna follow this order, right? So you have to play that game and continue to play it until you get to that position to where you can start making changes and you can start dictating and you can start telling people how this is going to go and you can start saying, oh, you're, gonna, you're not going to treat that medical student like that because I see what you're doing and you can intervene because now you are a board certified attending and now you can make that change with the power of respect, right? Um, he's so right. Um, you have to play the game. Um, I'll just kind of walk you through a quick journey of mine. So, you know, I was going to pharmacy school at Xavier, um, and then I had to leave. I lost all my stuff because of Hurricane Katrina. Um, so I had to move to Arkansas. I don't know if anyone ever been to Arkansas, but... Um, <laughs> so, you know, I go to pharmacy school there. It's about 200 kids in our class. It's me and one other black guy, right? So they're like, oh, um, none of the black males have made it through the program in about five or six years. You know, it's been, a, it is so dealing with racism is like navigating that and not failing and, and, you know, you're talking about Southern, white racism. Um, so 
the next part of that was, you know, I started working for Walgreens. I worked there for about 10 years. And the first place they sent me, because I'm the only Chicago pharmacist at the time when I was working for them, that had an Arkansas license. So they bought out a chain of pharmacies in Arkansas. Where did they send me? The mountains of Bella Vista, Arkansas. I mean, you can't get more redneck, more, you know, and I mean, they bought out, and I'm in the mountains, I mean, real mountains, like cell phone doesn't work, people only come to town, um, you know, maybe once a week or just to see the doctor, right? I mean, these are, I mean, so one of the things that, you know, got me through pharmacy school, got me through that experience, and similar experiences as being competent in my, in my, you know, in my profession. And that's what's critical is you can, you're always going to deal with racism, whether you're you, you, black, white, Latino, whatever it is, you're going to deal with racism, but you have to be competent. You have to know your stuff. You can't, I'm not going to say it, but you can't BS your way through things. Just know your stuff. I mean, um, so I quit Walgreens. Um, they gave me, you know, I had an uh, opportunity to, you know, be an um, area supervisor to be over, you know, 40, 50 stores. They wanted to send me to Detroit. I'm like, so you're going to send me to Detroit, um, and it was like a ranking system. I'm like, you're going to send me to the worst stores in Detroit um, after I'd managed, like, I'd moved from the south side. I managed maybe 30 different stores in the south side, then moved to Naperville, right? And that was like a big struggle. They're like putting a black guy over the busiest store in Naperville and get a bonus and all this other stuff. It was, it was a battle. But then uh, what I decided to do was like, you know what? You know, I'm going to quit. And it was like such a rash decision, you know, that people around you will say, you know, you lose your 401k, what are you going to do? I was like, I'm going to start my own pharmacy, you know? And um, during my last year, when I started getting frustrated with some of the things, I started um, working on my MBA at night. I would go to work, go to, you know, go to DePaul, do my MBA on the side. You know, it was hard, but um, it, you know, you have to have that freedom and you have to be competent. So from that, you know, I was able to start, you know, nine, I think we have 11 pharmacies that started now, um, nine in Illinois, one in, so, so, you know, when you talk about racism, imagine me going, you know, I wear, people who know me, I wear jeans, a t-shirt, a button down, and I carry my backpack and a coat, and I walk, I mean, I go all over. Um, so imagine me going into a bank, talking about, you know, <laughs> You all, so who are you? You're the, who are, you know, they, are, are you, do you work there? Are you, you know, one of the technicians? No, it's like, I own it. And I was like, you know, when, so you deal with racism and then even, um, it doesn't matter. You just have to be confident in yourself um, and know your stuff because you're always going to be challenged. And it's important that you, you learn the game because, you know, as much as we talk about racism, I mean, a lot of white people have helped me tremendously. Um, even now, you know, one of our biggest investors, you know, my company, you know, was <laughs> 10 white people, right? Um, so it's like, you just have to, you know, you're gonna experience racism, but you always have to understand where people, where they come from, and they don't always mean ill intent, and you just kinda have to, you have to be very humble, um, and have a people around you that you could talk freely with, not at the workplace or whatever, but, um, just be you, you know, and just, that's all. You know, we, we are, did you want to say something, brother? On the... He's parched. <laughs> Hydrate. Okay. Sorry about that. My little girl's got a little bug and she gave it to me. But I'm going to blame it on her, okay? <laughs> Nevertheless, um, let's start with some, to your question. So, three different types of racism. Institutional, you got interpersonal, you got internalized. Internalized racism is like, hey, I'm black, I'm not gonna get this job because I'm black, they looking at me a certain way. So I'm not gonna even try, right? <coughs> Sorry about that. <sighs> Bear with me. <sighs> so, institutional, you know what that is, right? That's the police, that's not admitting anybody to medical school, that's lack of representation, et cetera. Then you got interpersonal. That's, this person called me a name, small minds, strong backs, et cetera, that kind of stuff. The issue 
that most of us, like me and you, get caught up in is that the only one that changes things for everybody is changing the system, okay? So you gotta change the system to get change for everybody. <coughs> we get caught in interpersonal isms, right? So I walk in a, into my medical school, there's a professor, they treat me cool, but I feel like there's something off there. But then when I hear the students talk about me that are really close with the professor, it's, antagoni it's antagonistic. Right, they not sharing with me the resources, right? So I'm starting to feel like they don't like me, right? Something comes up, or you may date somebody in class or something like that. Now all of a sudden, rumors about that is flying around. Nothing that you can do do you feel like ends up being a positive for yourself. You just feel like it's negative. And then you start internalizing it, right? And now that internalized racism starts to bear its weight in terms of you not studying, you not doing what you're supposed to do, you sliding back into the same practices that didn't get you anywhere, right? But then let's say you progress through, you play the game, like the brothers up here have eloquated very, very well, right? You play the game, you get through, man. You get, you become a resident, you become a attending or something like that, and now you're in a position to change things. The problem with most of us, either in medicine <coughs> or in the streets, because I work with a lot of community organizers, is that <coughs> we're so traumatized by what we went through, through that, <coughs> that we only focus on those things. We focus on interpersonal, right? We wanna get rid of somebody who talks bad about us. <coughs> we wanna get the patient thrown out that said, I want a white doctor instead of the black doctor, right? And then we lose focus of the one thing that may change it for all of us, which is the system, changing that system. And not only do you lose focus, but you waste energy. Right, you're wasting energy chasing this person, chasing that person that says something, trying to get some clap back for this person that doesn't like you. I'm snitching to the higher authorities every time somebody says something bad about me, that then they start looking at you a certain way. Maybe they are racist, but now you're giving them fuel to say, yeah, that kid's just kind of sensitive, watch what you say around them. You haven't changed what they say. You change when and where they say it. Right? You change the language that they say. You have not changed how they think about you. You have not added representation into the mix. Right? You have not changed something that's going to benefit anybody other than your own, you know, traumatized self-ego. Okay? So that's what I would say. And that doesn't mean don't do those things if they're egregious. That just means reevaluate how you spend your energy. As opposed to you getting to the point where you're somebody like Dr. Johnson up here, a wonderful other esteemed faculty with tenure, right? Where you can now say, okay, well, I'm going to focus on creating a pipeline program to create more versions of myself. I'm going to build a bridge so that we can go back into these hoods and start helping people. I'm going to become a researcher where I'm going to study public health where my research ends up positively impacting the future aspirations of young black men and women that I've never met and that I probably will never Ever meet, right? That's going to help their communities, right? So I would say, as you go through that journey, take each one of those things. You, we all know that, right? How many of you all are like pre-med or medical students in here? Raise your hands. How many of you all, all of you all probably are, and those of you all who aren't, who will be, you're going to write essays that talk about diversity, that talk about addressing healthcare disparities. You're going to talk about the lack of representation, right? Most of the students that I work with all acknowledge that there are very few people that look like themselves that get in that journey, right? But yet, when they walk as a third or fourth year medical student to my emergency department or to any wards or whatever, and you run into two scenarios, we'll take you through these scenarios with you, okay? So bed number one has a white family, right? And they're sitting in the room, their patients in pain, et cetera. Bed number two, that has same nurse, right? But is a black family, all black from the south side of Chicago, or wherever you're from, that's the hoods, right? So you walk into room number one, and that family said, you say, hey, I'm doctor, I'm student doctor such and such. I'm here to gather some information that's gonna help our team. They say, or you're actually a resident. They say, you actually are a doctor, right? You say, I'm doctor such and such. They say, really? Are you a real doctor? Like, are you like a um, um, research doctor? Or are you like a nursing kind of doctor? Is your first name just happen to be doctor and you're really not a doctor, right? And then you, you, you kind of give a look and you say, you know, no, I'm a doctor, but then your nurse pulls you out of there and they say, hey, room number two needs to see you right away. You go into room number two, they're in pain, all black family. You walk into that room, they say, you say, I'm doctor such and such, I'm here to take care of you. Oh man, you a doctor? Like for real? Like, man, you like a TV doctor? You like, for real, for real doctor, right? You say, yo, I'm a doctor. Now, I stop right there. What's the two differences between that situation to you, the brother that asked the question? 
Well, I, the second one, let me. I, we, we're running out of time, brother, so I'm going to let you. We're getting to it. Skeptical in the first situation, okay? <clears throat> they proud of you, right? Maybe they love you, they got some encouragement for you, right? That's what most people say. You said the right answer, nothing. There's no difference in that. They are both acknowledging the paucity or the lack thereof of doctors that look like you. Whether they're racist or not, you don't know. You, don't, you can't prove it right there in a the moment. Your job is to take care of those patients. Your job is to better advance whatever the bigger goal that you're looking at in life as a doctor. That's your goal in that moment. So like they said, don't lose focus of why you're there. You're there to do a job. This is a service job to be a doctor. It's not some big prestigious thing all the time and that you can walk around with your chest poked out. Like you are there for an objective job and you got to do it. And if you're getting caught into what people are thinking about you, you're getting caught into whether they like you and all that kind of stuff stuff, it affects your job, especially if it's something that you just acknowledge, which that's there is racism that there are very few people like you. So when you see it, don't be surprised by it. Don't get thrown off by it. Keep your eyes on that system. Keep your eyes on opening up the door, giving back to your community. Your community depends on you, you right here, who's going to be an emergency doc off the south side of Chicago. They're depending on you to put that stuff in your pocket so that you can do something better for them, for their children, and for your own families. Okay, bro? Thank you. I want to bring this, I think this is an excellent question to end with. And, and I'll say one thing that I have for a goal. When I was a little girl, my grandmother told me, you got to be twice as good to get half as much. And when my granddaughters were little girls, I told them, you have to be twice as good to get half as much. And I want these babies, when they have grandchildren, not to have to say that. And for that to happen, we have to work together. When we come together, we have strength. Look at who's in this room. So you're here. I, and I want to do a shout out to all the physicians and students and people that are here helping run this conference, not getting a dime, not getting paid. They're reaching back. So if you're in high school, reach back to these kids in grammar school. If you're in college, reach back to the people in high school. We have to come together and build the institutions that we need institutions like Xavier, but all of us can't be at Xavier. I wish we all could. We got, to, we got to have people in positions to have influence, and that means we have to come together and fight for what's important. And every one of you suckers that's over 18, vote. <laughs>